So when you failed a lot, you eventually get good at something. And that is what I'm gonna start off today's video with, failure. Okay, onto the first question, which is how do, I, how do I get my photography mojo back after four months? Well, to be honest, this summer I've had a bit of a, I've sort of lost that creative mojo. And one thing that I did was sort of go back and look at some of my images in the early days, and it prompted me to talk a little bit more about that um, to begin with um, in this video, which is, which is photographic failure, and how I think whether you're just having a bit of a downturn in your creativity or you're just struggling to find how to get to the next step in your creativity, how failure is just so important in photography. So I wanted to show you a few images and tell you a little bit about these images and how I felt that I learned something from these images and it sort of took me to the next step. Because one of the things that I've done recently is just get out and shoot more. And I actually have, have shot lots more poor images but I feel that that's starting to, to pay dividends now and I'm starting to improve some of the things that I'm doing. So let's start with this first one. So this is an image that I took in Yosemite. It wasn't that long ago actually, probably two and a half years ago, something like that. It was a stunning evening. You can see by the clouds there that it was really stunning. And, I, and we'd gone to a place called Sentinel Point. What you can see there is Half Dome. But when I got this image back, I was sort of quite disappointed with it because it was, for me it was a little bit of a failure really. Um, I realized that the location I was in, Central Dome, is really high up and it, and it actually looked down on, on Half Dome. And because of that, Half Dome didn't look as majestic. And then I put these trees at the bottom, which at the time I thought was quite good, but it really doesn't give scale to the whole image. And then there's this cloud at the top, which is not very well. It's almost like three images put together and I, I, just, I just didn't like it. So I learned quite a few things from this image really. I learned that most importantly, having something like a mountain in the image, you need to have something that protrudes across that horizon. And if I look back at some of my other image, I found the same problem as well. But then when I started to, to, to look at some of my images that actually worked better where I had mountains in, and I took this one later on, so this was, this was taken about a year ago, and I, and actually, I remember taking this image and thinking back to the half dome Im, uh, image and thinking, right, I've got to really get to a location where I can re really set that apart from, from, from the surroundings. And I think that then provides more scale to the image. It provides something that's much, got much more drama. But ultimately, this was going down to me learning from failure. The other thing that I found that was really useful in the early days was going back to my sort of black and white roots. So what I used to do when I used to come back and I didn't used to like an image was, was to convert that image to black and white. And, and I found that that helps really well in the field as well. So if I'm, if I'm out with my camera and I usually do it with my phone, I just, put, I just take the photo and convert it to black and white. What that allows me to do is just look more at the shapes and textures in the image rather than looking um, an image that's maybe, I think, wow, this is a fantastic autumn image because it's really colorful. But if, but if you take, the colour out of the image and it's still amazing and you've probably got a very good composition but if you take the colours out of the image and nothing really hangs together very well then you've probably got something you need to look at so if you take this image this is one that I first sort of started to realise that on it was this, this really nice waterfall in amazing autumn colours but actually when I converted it to black and white it didn't look great because there was a lot of mess and, and the waterfall was sort of straight up in the image it just it just didn't work and I couldn't quite figure that out quite as well until I converted it to black and white. It's the same with this one here, which was an image that I took in the, the really foggy circumstances when I was walking around a place called Chatsworth House. I took the image, I was gonna wait for the people to go, I converted it to black and white to have a look at it, and it just didn't work as an image. But then, when I moved just a little, I walked a little bit down this path and turned to my right, and I got this amazing image of these trees. And I also converted that to black and white just to check and I found that I got something quite special. So it's a really good top tip. You know, tr try and, you know, if you've, if you've lost your mojo a bit, take more photos, go out and fail a lot more. You'll definitely improve. And try that sort of black and white tip as well. I think you'll find it really useful. Okay, so that was a, a long answer to the first question. My other one's gonna be a little bit more snappy. Okay, onto the next one, which is, what do you find to be the most challenging aspect of landscape photography and how do you keep an original st style? So um, I think for me, 
Management of my time is the most challenging one, which sounds like a really odd thing to say. But I, I feel that when you go out and do landscape photography, you probably have a moment of maybe five or 10 minutes to get something quite special. So you've got to make sure that prior to that moment, you manage your time as well as you can. So scout the location, make sure that you're not just snapping lots of different subjects, but concentrate on maybe two or three compositions so that when the light comes good, you can go to one of those two or three compositions, set your camera up and get something really spectacular. So if you can manage your time really well and make sure you scout that location, get there on time and you're much more likely to get a good shot. So that, that, would, be, that would be my top tip there. And, and then in terms of um, keeping an original style, that's difficult because you know, originality doesn't really exist so much anymore. There's pretty much everything's been done. But I always think that you can get, get something that, that is slightly unique to other people. I think that it's good to go and have a look on Instagram and look, read through books. And, and ultimately though, I think you've got to de define your style by what you enjoy doing the most. So if you enjoy doing seascapes, if you join, enjoy doing woodland, if you enjoy doing like I do, sort of bigger vista type stuff, then that's a good starting point. And then it's just a question of, you know, your styling, whether you're using wide angle or long lens or how you're edited it in Lightroom. But do something you love. Do something that you really care about rather than trying to do the in vogue thing. Okay, I've got a number of questions about sensor size and camera size and what do you think about full frame versus mirrorless? What do you think about Nikon's new camera system or Canon's new mirrorless camera system? And I think... Um, it, this is all the sort of same question for me. It's just gear. It doesn't really matter. I do care about gear. I like getting new gear. In fact, I'm I'm thinking myself about the whether I should go to Nikon mirrorless or get go completely to Fuji or or, or get um, the Nikon D850. But ultimately, that's just more about very small things in photography. I don't, it's not going to make any big change. Most of those decisions for me are around video rather than photography as well. So. I think get whatever camera you want. It doesn't really matter. The most important thing is just get out and shoot with it. Just get out, fail loads, and that will improve your photography more than worrying about what camera you need to get. Okay, I've got, I've got one here which says, if you can, can you show us how you set up and pack backpacking for overnight camping with all your camera equipment included? I'm having a little trouble packing mine without putting too much weight in my backpack. Well, I always put too much weight in my backpack, but, um, I have one of these, so this is, um, I'll link it in the description below, but it's just like a a little, um, and a battery as well, it's quite useful for my trip. Um, so if I can, f if it can't fit in here, it doesn't, my camera equipment doesn't come on, on, on my backpacking trip. So I can usually get my X-T2 in here, two lenses, and um, I can get my drone as well. So yeah, I just, I'm just really, restrictive with what I take on my backpacking kit trip. I also take a tripod, but I carry that. I don't put it in my backpack. I, I usually just carry it. Works well as a walking stick as well. So for just getting getting down the hill or up the hill. So I, fi I find that useful. Okay, on to the next question. It's not specifically a photography question for me, but I'd like to know a book you think we should all read. Okay, so a book. Book's behind me, let me grab one. So, this one's a pretty good one. So this is, can you hope you can see that there? So this is Cross Down by Helen Levitt. I love this book. It's it's not landscape photography. It's a lot of street photography, um, but it's it's one of my favorite books. And I, I, I learned a lot about composition looking through this book. I don't read a lot, I'm dyslexic, so it's it's not something I can really advise on, but this has got lots of photos in it. I love looking through it. And generally, I like photographic books. You can see by my bookshelf behind me, and there's lots more over it where you can't see. I, I just love getting photographic books. It inspires me. So so any photographic book would be good. Okay, so somebody else has said here, can, can you briefly go over the guidelines that you use for pixels and what resolution you believe is acceptable when doing smaller, larger prints. So, so that's an interesting one. If we take a 24 megapixel camera like the Fuji X-T2, then that's 6,000 pixels wide at its highest, resolu highest resolution. And it's typically thought that you want around about 300 pixels per inch to be able to get an acceptably sharp print. 
Now I think you can probably get away with a bit less than that, but that means that you can have something along a 20 inch image on a 24 megapixel print. And if you take do the same sum for a 45 megapixel camera like the Nikon D850, then you can go pretty much up to a 27 inch print. Now the reality is that you can probably push both of those a little bit further. What I do is, is print A2 for, for all my limited edition prints and that's fine for my Fuji X-T2 and my Nikon D850. You can't tell the difference between two prints printed at that size, um, whether they are 30, 40 or 24 megapixels. Okay, next one is, is it too late to start a landscape photography vlog at YouTube from scratch? No, this is a simple answer to that. I started mine a year ago and just over a year ago and you know, at the time I was looking at all, all these other vloggers and thinking, God, I'm never gonna get any traction here, but obviously I did. And I think it's all about just producing quality content. If you can produce quality content and you do it regularly and you're passionate about it, then people want to watch it. So I've, I've always taken that view that as, as long as I keep producing good content and really care about my audience, then I'm, I'm gonna to continue to get subscribers. As soon as I stop doing that and stop being passionate about it, then that'll probably end. But then I won't wanna do it anyway, will I? Um, okay, so what's the best size to print and start selling prints and the base price? So the best price, the best size is A3, I think. I sell more A3 than I do A2, and I think um, I don't sell many A4s because I just don't put them up for sale. Um, but this is an A3 print. I think it's a good size. I think it, you know, it's a, so if somebody wants a really big print, then okay, fine, they can get an A2 one. But I think most people just want something of a sort of a medium size to put on the wall. In terms of pricing, that's difficult. It's up to you. You've got to base it on the number of limited editions, the number of effort you put into getting that shot, how unique you think that shot is. And, you know, don't under, underpriced yourself because obviously you put a lot of effort into going out probably and getting that shot you've got to edit it you take probably thousands of shots to get one portfolio shot so don't underprice yourself but also don't price yourself out of the market as well okay the next one is what do you consider the most important ingredient that transforms a snapshot into a photograph um well, that's a really good question, actually. I think there's four ingredients that make a good photograph. I mentioned them here in this video, which are light, timing, subject, and composition. I think if you get all those four, then you usually get a really good photograph. To make an amazing photograph, something that takes it from a snapshot to a photograph, well, I think it is those four images, but the secret ingredient, I think, is story. So if you can get story into it, if you can tell a story with that image and really draw the viewer in, then you know, I think that you can produce something that's quite special. So that's why I'd, I'd, I'd recommend just thinking about the story of your image. So a good example of that probably is this, this image here that I took at Blee Tarn of the rain and the rainbow. I think that tells a story because you, you can see that the rain's just started, the clouds are coming over and the mist. So it, it tells a bit of a story of the day and I can look back at that and, and feel quite proud about it as well. I don't think it's a snapshot as such. Okay, so that's it. Um, I'm going to Finish packing my stuff now for the Faroe Islands. I'm hoping, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll put a lot on Instagram when I'm in the Faroe Islands if I've got a good signal. Um, so follow my stories there and comment. I really enjoy getting your comments back on those stories that I put on Instagram as well. I'll also put some stuff on YouTube channel when I'm there as well in the um, community. So t take a look there. Thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye. Mm -hmm.